Cool. Welcome to our counterculture tonight um, video, our first one. Um, and we're going to be thinking about some questions that have come up um, that are specific to being a young adult and being a disciple um, in this current time. And I'm um, really glad that uh, Caleb and Sam have come to join us for this. Um, they are going to be speaking on one of the three questions each. Um, and so if you want to grab a Bible, grab a coffee, just pause this video um, go and grab that um, and then sit down. Maybe you want a pen and paper so you can take some notes so that you're really ready um, to meet with your small group later on this week. And um, so Sam is going to start us now and he's going to start us with um, the question, um, I'm a Christian, but what difference does it make? So over to you, Sam. Fab. Well, it's a bit weird, but we'll try and uh, communicate with you all uh, in a helpful way. I last night read this pretty funny joke, so I thought I'd start with it. But for the first time in history, we can save the human race by lying in front of the telly and doing nothing. Let's not screw this up. Anyway, um, that's not what I'm talking about, but I thought it was uh, a helpful point to see that there's a different perspective to a Christian perspective. And obviously we're not gonna focus on that. We're gonna think a little bit about how as a Christian we can respond and what difference does it make to be one at this time? Um, and I'm not going to read the whole of Psalm 23, but um, that's what I'm going to encourage you and your small groups to look at. And uh, I was touched very recently by this psalm, and uh, particularly this time. And I'm going to just focus on the first verse and the last verse, uh, like a good old preacher. Um, and uh, we'll just do that together now. So the first verse starts like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. A lot of us, um, for a lot of us, we don't keep sheep. In fact, I don't know any student that looks after sheep, at St. Thomas's at least. Um, so it, it's a bit strange to think of God as a shepherd. Um, but the idea of a shepherd uh, in the centuries gone by when this was written was someone who cared for the sheep and sheep are surprisingly dependent creatures. They really struggle to look after themselves all the time. And when the psalmist writes that um, I too am a sheep because he says the Lord is my shepherd, he's admitting that he's an equally needy creature. And perhaps this time more than others, people are admitting that, that they're needy. And uh, it's very easy just as people living in the UK to be saying that actually the supermarkets are my shepherd because they're still open and they may not have everything in it, but we can get what we need. And um, obviously that's not what we're, we're, we're saying is in this Psalm. Um, equally, we can say the government's our shepherd, you know, they'll provide through the benefit system. We'll be all right. Again, that's not what the Psalmist is saying. Um, or we can say, we're our own shepherd. You know, we'll control our activities. You know, we'll not go out and we'll be fine. And that's also not what the psalmist is saying. And so I just encourage you to, at this time, to, to really um, meditate on those words. The Lord is my shepherd. He's the one who's in charge of my life. He's the one I depend on. And I'm in the care, fortunately, of someone much bigger much stronger and much wiser than me and he's able to protect me um, even through to all eternity no matter what happens here in my time um, but simply i'm going to go to the last verse and i'll read it first uh, verse six says surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and i will dwell in the house of the lord forever and I just leave that as really an encouragement to each of us that as we say, God, you're in charge of my life. Uh, I trust you. I depend on you. Um, there's this real amazing 
promise really that that God says that even in this time that your goodness which is God's generosity and his love or his loyalty will follow me or it'll be with me it'll pursue me every day of my life all the days of my life and uh, I want to encourage you that um, even at this time God's goodness his generosity his loyalty uh, it can be a feature of your every day because that's just who God is and he wants to bless us in those ways and so uh, I'll leave that with you to think about there's a couple of questions which we'll uh, discuss in your small groups over to Louise thanks Sam it was so helpful um, it's really great to think about God being our shepherd um, and what other things are we looking at to be our um, shepherd at the moment how can we look at God instead um, so maybe you want to take a moment to um, just pause the video again um, before we launch into our next question. Just reflect and ask God what he's speaking to you about. Uh, cool. So we're going to jump into our next question, which is, um, I've got a new mission field, um, but how can I still share the gospel? Um, and I'm going to start by reading um, a passage from Acts. Um, so you can find that just after the Gospels in your Bibles. Um, and we're going to look at Acts 1, verses 7 to 11, which says this. He said to them, that's Jesus, by the way, uh, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Well, I think our mission fields have undoubtedly changed over the last few weeks. Um, it might feel disconnected or strange, and um, for some it even feels downright scary. Um, there's something new going on and there's no real shying away from how big that is. And so what I'm not about to say is, hey, your mission fields have changed and you just have to try harder. <laughs> Or this is easy because it's not. It's just the same but over the internet. That's not true, is it? Um, and we might not be living up to the fullness of what it means for us to be evangelists and what we can be if we can do that. Um, and just as a side note, not all of us will have a strong desire to, or a gifting to be an evangelist. But Jesus' great commission in Matthew, go and make disciples of all nations, is actually for all of us. And so in a month from now, um, the Church of England will mark a day in the church calendar called Ascension Day. And um, that's where our first passage in Acts is from. The disciples had just been through a pretty wild ride <laughs> for the previous three weeks. Um, They'd gone from teaching and healing and performing miracles with Jesus and, and he was guiding them and probably chiding them as well. And then suddenly they'd gone through a whirlwind. They'd watched one of their closest friends betray Jesus and then disappear. They'd watched as Jesus was beaten and mocked, scorned and eventually killed. They grieved for the man they'd known. They were perplexed, confused, about what everything he'd said had meant and then they'd met him again the same but different and almost as soon as he'd come back to them he went again and we come to watch the disciples just staring up into heaven at Jesus and I kind of find myself in that I don't know about you but in a lot of this situation I just kind of find myself looking at the church looking at God looking at the news and that's kind of it I'm just absent-mindedly staring. But these men in white robes, who presumably are angels, startle us out of our absent-mindedness. The message translation says, you Galileans, why do you just stand here looking up at an empty sky? <laughs> they go on to say that 
and Jesus will come back, but that he won't come back the way he went. So what they're doing is kind of useless by just staring off at the sky. And if we stare with longing back to the way things were before, the way we were able to evangelise or share the gospel with our friends before all this happened, we too may as well just be staring off into an empty sky. We can't wish our way back there. We can't um, make things like that again. Um, and some of us might not be feeling that great and we might not feel able to just bounce out of that state of feeling unsure or grieving the past. And that's okay. We do have to be gentle with ourselves. And Caleb's going to talk a bit about that later. But do you take heart because the disciples had been through a grief cycle like many of us have. They had had drastic, drastic life changes and they were understandably frightened. But after a few days of watching and waiting and praying, the most exciting thing happened. And it's something that's still happening today. So we're just going to skip a little bit of that <laughs> onto what happens shortly after at the time that we call in the church Pentecost. It says this, Acts 2, 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Just hear those words. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and he will come and fill you too. If you're a believer, the Bible says that the Spirit of God lives in you. That's in Romans 8. And that's such good news here because even though there's a new way of doing mission practically, the person who's guiding us, the inspiration, the creativity, the one that really turns people towards the Father is still the same. He's still doing the same work. So your invitation to your mates to come to church or come to your small group, that messenger group chat that's replaced your late night chats in the kitchen or your discord night with your sports team can still just be as powerful and effective. For Holy Spirit, the barriers are no different from how they were before. They might feel different for us. We might be looking at a completely different mission field in front of us. But also take heart because you're not speaking to strangers in most of your contexts. You're talking to people who you already know, who already trust you and love you and care for you. And if you're in a home or in an environment where there aren't other believers, Holy Spirit's still there with you too. And so he is with you and he's going to reveal to you, reveal God to your family. He's going to reveal God to your friends or your housemates. He can give you answers if there are questions. He can also say, I don't know. <laughs> he will equip you and the pressure's not on you because if they reject your words, remember it's not you they're rejecting. We've well, been given the power and the opportunity to take part in God's mission and that's exciting. And while it's a privilege and a responsibility to act, it's not your name on the line. So just remember that even though it feels disconnected and it feels different, God knows what he's up to and the Holy Spirit is still with you and still doing this mission. So I hope that's helpful. Um, and if you want to think a bit more practically about how as St. Thomas is and as a group, we can start doing practical mission. Um, let's chat. I'd love to hear it. Um, so yeah, over to Caleb now. He's going to talk to us about our next question. Yeah, so uh, while everything Louise said has is great and we should be looking to do mission, at the minute people probably aren't feeling great. And if you're really not feeling up to things, like that's okay. So the passage I'm going to look at is uh, Mary and Martha in Luke 10, 38-42. So as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had been made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. 
Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And in this passage, it shows that Jesus uh, puts emphasis that the priority should be on spending time with him rather than distracting yourself with work. While there's a lot going on, Mary chooses to sit down with Jesus and just listen to him and spend time of reflection with him. Uh, it's important to know that Jesus doesn't rebuke Martha for not doing this, but instead just commends Mary. While doing, obviously doing work is great, but spending time with God is more important. Uh, Martha is obviously worried by having to host, especially for a man as esteemed as Jesus. And so she's distracted herself by constantly working. And she's, so she's preoccupied and not able to fill her mind with the Lord. But Mary is chosen specifically to spend the time with Jesus rather than worrying about everything else. And she is commended by Jesus for this. He says that Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her because Jesus won't be taken away from us. He is the stability in the chaos that's going on at the minute. So it's, it is very easy at the minute to get distracted by, or to distract yourself even by throwing yourself wholly into everything. But Jesus is, uh, is earlier in this chapter, Jesus tells us the first and second commandment in order of priority. His second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself which is you know, very up there. But more importantly, he says to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. So it's easy to get distracted by throwing yourself into serving, but really considering the purpose. Like, it benefits your neighbors, but you should be serving for God first and foremost. And like I said, it's really easy to fall into a Martha-style role at the minute, where we just serve and distract ourselves, trying to avoid the mess that's going on. But really, we should be looking to God like Mary is. She leaves everything else that's going on and just sits with Jesus. Uh, like, just prioritizes him above everything else. Like, society at the time and even now would see this as lazy. And her sister definitely does. She even calls that, like, to Jesus, tell her to work. And Jesus answers, you know, you're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or only one, meaning him and his father. Mary had the choice to work for her sister and be distracted, but she chose what is better. And to say, even now, we'll do the same thing. Like, if you go on Twitter or Facebook or anything at the minute, there are people who are saying, you know, we've got this quarantine, quarantine time. You use it to make money or learn hobbies or whatever. But it's completely okay to take a break. You can't work at the speed society to 24-7. Would like our bodies aren't designed for it, and this could be a time of break and reflection for everybody. Jesus celebrates Mary's choice to slow down, and he spends so much of the Gospels just resting in his Father's presence, like focused on him, and he encourages us to do the same. So why not use this time for that? Obviously, if you're not feeling great at the minute, though, like some forms of spending time with God is hard. But if you open up to a controversial passage or a hard to understand passage. It can just pile on and like you're already in a bad mindset and then you don't want to spend any more time with God. But like, there's nothing wrong with spending easier time reading a gospel or a psalm. Stuff that's easy to understand. But when you spend time with God and get closer to him, he'll also get closer to you. Letting you, so like, and it might get easier to spend more time with him. Like, however it is, you originally spend time with him, you'll, get closer basically other options that would also work like if you really are not up to reading anything talk to christian friends mentors pastoral figures whatever they can support you through this give you easier resources i'm sure any of us would be happy to help or your other small group leaders uh, or if you you know don't want to put anywhere near as much effort in put some worship music on listen to some YouTube content, whatever, like, like it's still spending time with God if you're sitting there actively watching something to support your relationship with him. So 
yeah re- like use this time to spend time with god and get closer because we have the time and it should be your first priority